Where are we with whiteness in America, and how did we get here? Yeah. In, um, in two, in three, four minutes or less. No, okay, kidding. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Well, Just kidding. <laughs> uh, let me let me start by uh, saying how happy I am to be here and how glad this is supper time in the Midwest. So for people to come out at five o'clock at night, I was skeptical. And thanks, for, thanks for coming. Um, and apologies to those who had lunch. I only have so many little bits of knowledge, and so there'll be repetition. I won't repeat any jokes, but some of the analysis will be repeated. Um, I, I think it's important to think about tone when we begin to address these matters. Um, I was trained by Sterling Stuckey, the great African-American historian. And, and the first thing he'd often say about writing is, what, what tone are you trying to strike here? Mm -hmm. If you're writing about slavery, what's the tone? And I think that the Trump experience for those of us on the left and who've been studying these things uh, invites a kind of um, um, panic, first of all, mm -hmm. but also a kind of self-congratulation that now is the moment where people are finally going to have to listen mm. to us. And it is true that everywhere I go now, the the crowds are much, much larger than they would be otherwise. And I, I get that. Mm -hmm. But I think the tone has to still be a kind of a humble tone, right? That, that uh, we have been trying. We have had ideas. I didn't foresee Trump. Mm -hmm. Did you? Not immediately, but pretty soon, about halfway through I was like, okay, this Halfway really through the happen. night or the election no. campaign? <laughs> <laughs> no, around, around um, July, August, before the election. Okay. So on election night, you knew oh, that Trump would win? I was just, I was in a fantasy land. I was like, nah, I was just worried about nothing. And then I went into a complete sweating panic, Yeah. basically. Yeah. But, um, but no, I, I just said, you know, this is really possible for a lot of reasons. It was yeah. more just sort of calculations. So I think we need to stay in that moment of um, humility that grows out of yeah. how unexpected this was, even if this is kind of our life's work to study these, these yeah. matters. I, yeah. uh, I didn't get it. All of my undergraduate African-American women students said, well, of course Trump will, will win. And I, and I said, I, I don't think so. I just don't, don't see it. And I had also kind of, in my work, imagine that uh, white nationalism doesn't have very much to do with everyday whiteness mm. in the United States, that it's kind of a separate thing and that there's a line between the far right's whiteness and the ways that people are mostly oppressed. Now, when you begin to talk about police and jails there's, and, and guards, mm -hmm. there's a, a different dynamic to that. But now I think, and this is part of what you're raising, that there is a, a moment now where we have to really talk about uh, what it is to have a white nationalist president and, and what, it, what it says about um, the larger ways that whiteness rules. Right, right. You know, the thing that surprised me the most was not that there was this, you know, core group of white nationalists that were being brought out of the woodworks, but how much everyday, ordinary, not just whites, but sort of middle-of-the-road liberals of all backgrounds um, didn't ultimately read the politics as white nationalism right away. I remember saying, we have a, a white nationalist government. People like, oh, yeah. you know, we just elected a white, as like a white supremacist president. Oh, you're so dramatic, Tricia. You yes. know, you're so, you know, and I think, like, no, I'm really not. I was like, that's yeah. what we did. And yet, you know, it, it took people, it seems, a, not all people, but a number of people you would have expected to immediately be hysterical to, to, to read it differently. Did you have that experience? Yes, and I, I was trying to puzzle out factions in the administration and say, well, if it's Bannon today and then he's right. on the outs and this is a defeat for the right. white nationalists. But none of those factional groupings have persisted, really. Right. Uh, it kind of runs through people. And yet this core, the, the reflex that when you're in trouble, you go to a white nationalist appeal uh, I think that that's the core of it, rather mm -hmm. than this group of advisors or that group of mm -hmm. advisors. Yeah, although the ones that remain are pretty, you know, pretty well entrenched. If, yes. You know, yes. In, in any event. Um, so is Trump then uh, uh, sort of a, 
a symbol of a long-standing set of practices? Is this the long march of, of you know, the origins of white supremacy in the West in this formation, or is there something different? I mean, how much of this is, you know, new, and how much of it has a level of, you know, meaningful continuity? I think both. I think it's a, it's an elaboration of things that were happening for a long time. I tried to write about for a while and, and did a little bit right-wing talk radio, and I think that, and listened to a lot of right-wing talk radio in the Midwest, and I think that you know, there's a, there's a fair amount of the habits of Trump and really the habits of his listeners mm -hmm. that grow out of that uh, ability uh, for Rush Limbaugh or Sean Hannity to, mm -hmm. to kind of uh, posit themselves as the brave person who for the first time is saying what's being said in your home already uh, along racial lines, along anti-immigrant right. lines. So I think that you know, that's, that's very old. That's 30 or 40 years old on uh, talk radio. But, and I, part of my problem is I don't know how seriously to take uh, Trump as a, I mean, obviously as a threat and a phenomenon, seriously, yes. But um, uh, Bill Crystal, the uh, neocon uh, uh, commentator who's now back to being a critic of, of Trump, uh, has been saying on TV, we have to realize how smart Trump is. Mm -hmm. And that the worst thing that Trump's critics do is dismiss him, him as just mm -hmm. uh, unserious and random and, you know. Right. And I hmm. get that. I don't want to be in a conversation about how smart Trump is. I think <laughs> there is a certain way that the uh, randomness is the is what gets him over and, and the uh, that, that he's not a, a political thinker, uh, and that's different, I think, that, right. that you know, the uh, racist before uh, racism would work conjoined to polling data. Mm -hmm. I don't think, except in a very general way, that Trump cares about polling data. And right. Yeah. But I mean, you know, he could be smart uh, and unwell and wily all at once. Yeah. I mean, it's not, you know, there have been many maniacal smart people in and history. This is, and and uh, maniacal in ways that are congenial to the larger society. Absolutely. And taps yeah. into certain, yeah. you know, feelings. But, you know, I'm interested in this habit that you talked about, listeners on right, you know, on right-wing radio and commentators and, and anchors. I'm, I'm interested in, you know, sort of, the pattern of what happened in the wake of the civil rights movement, which is um, that produced this notion of reverse racism, right? Mm -hmm. That whites are at a disadvantage if the playing field is attempted to be leveled. And, and that the habit then is that what the victories of, say, just, just to be simplistic here, just the victories of the civil rights movement did was force a certain kind of white privilege into into a certain kind of narrative silence, right? It, mm -hmm. it created a silence. So, I mean, do you think that this there's some truth potentially to um, there have been having been a missing piece of the strategy, a kind of re-education program for whites, right, as opposed to just a legal change? Yeah. Because I'm really struck by how convinced when I occasionally listen, because I don't have the stomach for right wing radio, <laughs> you're, you're a bright, I just don't have it. Um, but I get, I get enough, and I figure I got the gist. Yeah. Um, but this sense that of, of betrayal and being wronged, not by the business class, not by the billionaire elites, right? Not by capitalism, but by immigrant people of color, African Americans, et cetera, et cetera. That this is really where the harm has been done, and I'm just wondering, you know what that tells us, not just about whiteness, but also about political strategies that, that may or may not have been yeah. attempted. I've been reading with my students this introduction to E.P. Thompson's uh, making of the English working class. And he talks about class being a relationship. And he, he thinks of it as a Marxist, as a two-party relationship. Mm -hmm. He says, there's no love without lovers. There's no deference without squires and laborers. And I think that you know, one of the things we paid for is that for years, working people in the United States thought of themselves as middle class. That's changing a little bit. Mm -hmm. But who's the other for the middle class? I'm not sure. I understand. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you get that to do that? <laughs> I just want you to know, Siri never does 
what I say. <laughs> I have cursed her out and she blames me for having bad language, but for the first time, I press to see the time and she wants to know what's going on. <laughs> oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, David. <laughs> She said, I'm sorry, I don't understand you. I'm like, yeah, that's no well. kidding. <laughs> okay. So, so we'll get back to A.P. Thompson. Edward's point there is okay. that, that we know our class by the others that we right. imagine. Right. And I think that kind of built into this idea that the, what was called the middle class uh, now is being called the white working class. Um, a middle class always has two others. It has a mm. chance to look up and say mm. during Occupy, the genius of Occupy in some ways was that the 1% re-entered the conversation of U.S. politics and you could look up and, and find your other. But it also has this opportunity to look down mm -hmm. and, and find your other. And the state, the culture, I think, is much more congenial to having people who have their own economic grievances look down at somebody else than right. to look up at their uh, at their enemies, and so I think we're, we we kind of see that develop now that the the middle classness or the hankering to be middle class right. uh, takes the form sometimes, uh, and I'm not. I'm not wanting to apply that the, that Trump was elected uh, by white workers. We can. We can talk about that later. Mm -hmm. But uh, to the extent that he enjoyed support from people whose economic interests were not at all in supporting him, I think it's that temptation to say, we, we know we're of this position, beleaguered as we are, yeah. because we can see those uh, below us. And, the, and those are uh, people who are on benefits, uh, mm -hmm. people who are immigrants. Those are the, mm -hmm. the groups that stand out as vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although many people were on benefits, voting I mean, against the benefits, yeah. that you know, yeah. it's yeah. I was in uh, uh, South Carolina when Gingrich was running in the primaries, mm -hmm. and he won the South Carolina primary this long time ago now by uh, describing Obama as the food stamp president. president. Yeah, and the press in Columbia, South Carolina, I, I was a visitor there for a semester, asked me if I thought that could work, and I said, well, of course it can't work. Almost every white family in South Carolina knows somebody in their family that's on that's on food stamps, but it worked. Yeah, it did. Yeah. You know, it worked. It's, a, it's yeah. an interesting dissociation that's that's required. Yeah. Um, so you know, one of the answers for how we got here does follow from what you're saying now, which is that um, there was too much focus among Democrats, in particular, on racial inequality and ethnic and immigration inequality and that we or the Democrats or the left obviously folded in abandoned the white working class and that this core group um, were, were able to find a home in both the Republican Party but especially in Trump in particular. What, what would you say to this? I mean you've heard this I'm sure yes. a million times. Yeah. Yes. And I, I think that there's the truth in it is that uh, Democrats don't have any successful way to talk about class and mm -hmm. what they want for working people mm -hmm. in the main. I don't think that uh, that in answering the, the kind of charge analysis that you just laid out, mm -hmm. we should move to the position that everything's okay with the Democrats where, where class is concerned, because I think it is a, a, a big problem. Um, one of the favorite things after the election uh, journalistically, was to go to some beleaguered place in Appalachia, right. uh, Harlan County, historic labor place now without mines, mm -hmm. basically, and to find some poor person who had voted for uh, Trump and was now losing their health insurance. Right. And, you know, so the, the kind of um, undertone of it was what a stupid move this was, mm -hmm. to, and fair enough. But the other thing we could ask is, uh, why wasn't the health insurance compelling enough? Why was it only Obamacare and not uh, socialized Affordable medicine, mm -hmm. uh, not even single payer? Uh, why was it not compelling enough to keep those poor people inside the ranks of the Democratic Party? So I think it's it's very easy mm. to look at elections and say mm -hmm. um, 
this is about the movement of white workers toward Trump, mm -hmm. uh, and it's only driven uh, by th that the only way that whiteness comes into it is that whiteness structures the appeals of Trump. Whiteness also structures mm -hmm. the lack of appeals of the Democratic Party, that we don't have a full-blown, even social democratic politics because Democrats are so afraid of being accused of providing benefits that are going to go to, to people of color. Mm -hmm. So that you get this really atten attenuated welfare state and it's hard to defend it. There's not enough there to defend in a lot of uh, instances. Mm -hmm. So right. both those things are true. Yeah, that's really interesting. So do you think that the Democrats have not worked hard enough to figure out how to thread that needle between appealing to these class concerns of whites without looking like they're providing benefits? Have they worked hard enough at this? Or do you think it's an impossible conundrum, right, the race, the race class problem? I'd be very interested what people say about this, but it, it's mystifying to me in some ways. During the Sanders campaign, uh, which some of us, I'm sure, were involved in, um, when uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates uh, raised reparations as a mm -hmm. possible Sanders demand, as a Sanders supporter, right. uh, that was so roundly criticized, including by people on the left. Uh, as impossibleist politics and as, you know, and the, the uh, yeah. answer was the Sanders strategy of appealing to the rights of poor people will automatically raise mm -hmm. people of color because yeah. uh, they're poor. Um, that's never really worked. And, yeah. and uh, most of the uh, social policies that get put on the chopping block are not pro-black social policies, they are universal social policies. Aid to families with dependent children when mm -hmm. uh, Clinton got uh, signed it, uh, ended welfare as we know it, that wasn't a racialized social policy. That was a well, non-racial. It had been racialized. But it had, yeah. Right. So, you know, on the one hand, uh, there's, there hasn't been a way to figure out how to talk about those things in universal terms or how to not lose that debate to white supremacy. Uh, right. But sometimes I think that the, the uh, Democrats also haven't tried very hard in that, right, in that right. regard. I mean, it, it, you know, it may be possible that there's, you know, the, the wages of whiteness, which I'd love it if you could just give the audience, you know, both the Du Boisian and your, your yeah. analysis of what that is. But it could be that, it's, 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 that it creates a fundamental conflict. Right, mm -hmm. because you can't have the wages of whiteness and have the wages of classness simultaneously in a multiracial context. Yeah. But so describe just for everyone briefly what wages of whiteness are and how you think they might be playing out now. Um, during the Reagan presidency, so the, the Reagan presidency, we had debates a little bit like this, mm -hmm. the, what were called <laughs> the Reagan Democrats. Uh, uh, trade union members, white ethnic so-called, uh, had voted for New Deal candidates for decades. Right. All of a sudden, enough of them, not all, but enough change to deliver two elections to, to Reagan uh, in the 80s. And all of a sudden, you get this outpouring. This is the moment of critical study of whiteness mm -hmm. uh, entering the academy. Mm -hmm. And it's because so many people were concerned in the same way that a lot of you are here because you're concerned about Trump. So many people were concerned about where did these Reagan Democrats come from? And so my question, and I you know, had thought about this as a revolutionary for a long time, not just in terms of electoral politics, but uh, my question at that point was, okay, people are talking about white workers all the time. Where, where are, what's the history of these white workers? Mm -hmm. Where did they come from? And it turns out that the first serious treatment of the white worker in U.S. history was Du Bois's Black Reconstruction. It's anchored around chapters on the black worker, the white worker, and the planter. So the class structure and race structure of the, of the South. Mm -hmm. And deep into that book, uh, Du Bois uh, is describing the loyalty of whites who don't own property mm -hmm. to whites who do own property in the South, and he says they weren't necessarily paid uh, 
great material wage, mm -hmm. but they were paid what he calls a, a public and psychological wage. Mm -hmm. Right. And there are wage differentials, too. Some of this is material, and Du Bois very much realized that some of it was material. But it, this is uh, Du Bois' first time writing really seriously with Freud in mind. He, he actually meant psychology in a very modern psychology uh, sort of way, and when he says public, he's kind of meaning you can go to the park, to, to the best park, you can send your kids to the best school, mm -hmm. you can live in the best neighborhood, mm -hmm. um, very like today, for example. Yeah. Uh, so he was describing that, and I, I took it, uh, the title of the book that I wrote about the history of the white worker was The Wages of Whiteness, in tribute to Du Bois's insight, and then also kind of trying to play off of the idea of the wages of sin, that uh, mm. these are wages that are also uh, not worth having and, and mm. destructive. And, and uh, the hardest thing, I think, in the critical study of whiteness for many of us has been to engage how whiteness makes whites miserable. It's easy enough to talk about the advantages mm. of whiteness mm. and necessary to talk about the uh, advantages of, of whiteness. But what Du Bois was driving at and what, above all, James Baldwin uh, drove at was to say, how do we talk about the, the fact that whiteness is a misery-producing machine for people of color, but likewise encourages people to accept miserable lives on the other side mm -hmm. of, the, of the color line. So when uh, Baldwin collects his essays from the last 30 years of his life in The Price That's of the true. Ticket, the price of the ticket is for Baldwin the adoption by white immigrants of white identity, uh, mm -hmm. mainstream white identity in the, in the United States. So it's, it's that ability to be able to, to say without losing sight of white advantage, mm -hmm. or what was the term you used at lunchtime? White priority. Yeah. Uh, without losing sight of that, to also be able to talk about the the wages of whiteness as something that mm. already limits what people can imagine in terms of a good of a good society, and that's I think where Du Bois was going. Is this moment it, the, he introduces it at a point in the book where poor whites are having to decide if they're going to be supporters of radical reconstruction mm -hmm. or not. And he's, he's trying to explain why some do, and there right. are heroic, ongoing experiments in democracy, but most don't. Right. And so, and they do, when they don't, it's to the detriment of black radicals and, and uh, Republicans in the South, but it's also, he says, to the detriment uh, of, of white poor people right. in the South. So. Right. So, so do you, do you, so it is, in this case, the wages, or sort of, shall we say, the minimum wages of whiteness, <laughs> yeah, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. Because it's not that, say, bourgeois or upper middle class whites are at a big disadvantage or are suffering. Or are you are you making a more philosophical claim that these racial categories, uh, racial uh, you know categories, divide and oppress and provide a lot of fear and produce you know a spiritual uh, deficit and that this is the kind of suffering or is it that it's an economic matter i think that both, both and mainly the the former i think it's it's mostly about uh keeping uh white people without property out of political coalition right, with with, uh, with with people of color but there's also a sense my mom is about to turn 96 and she's fine now but about eight years ago she had a stroke and she had, a, you know, was in a good union. She was a school teacher. Had a, has good health care. Nobody in the United States has good health care. I mean, it's just that yeah. you, because the United States has constructed its welfare state in the way that it's constructed, it, that's so afraid that somebody's going to get over by getting uh, benefit uh, from society that everybody suffers because of that. Even going, I mean. I, the super rich can afford very, very good private health care, but we all pay pay for that. And we all pay for the fact that it's so hard to imagine a different kind of society. It's mm -hmm. so hard to have any kind of political imagination right. that would say this could be very, very different right. kind of place. Yeah. So, it, so how has critical whiteness studies grappled with this from your perspective? I mean, this is a tough, I mean, 
this seems a lot tougher than the sort of critical breakdown of how whiteness works, you know? Yeah. So have you, what would you say has been a successful uh, component of addressing this aspect of it in whiteness studies? Or, or what's the biggest thing that really has been almost impossible to kind of wrench free? Well, we don't, we haven't caught up with Baldwin, I think, well, in, none of us in many, many ways. <laughs> and it's, it's, Baldwin, I'm going to South Africa right after this. And, and uh, I don't know, I have, some of you maybe are Straight from, from Providence? <laughs> no, really, no, not exactly, okay. I was going to say. No. Two days of teaching. And, okay. Um, but um, <laughs> if you've been to South Africa recently, there's so much panic about crime. And there's quite a bit of crime also in, in South Africa. But uh, one of the things I want to try to, to talk about in South Africa is Baldwin has this line where he says that the, one of the most pernicious uh, effects of whiteness has been to allow people to believe in an illusion of safety. Mm -hmm. that the, that the, and I think this is very much mm -hmm. goes to the heart of Trump, that if it mm -hmm. weren't for the criminal Mexican, Mm -hmm. if, it, if it weren't for the interloping African-American, mm -hmm. if, if, if there, you could have a perfectly safe All white society. world, yeah. And, uh, you know, who's writing about that now? And I, you know, I know it as a problem mm -hmm. and still can't figure out a way to, to really write about it without putting that... Uh, without worrying that to put that minus for white people out there somehow detracts from the minus for everybody else in society. Right. It's, it's not an easy thing to write about to do. Yeah. That, that's why I was so interested. Is it Shannon Sullivan? Is yeah, it, yeah, is, the white priority. About, yeah. yeah. You know, I, at lunch we were talking about drawing distinctions between kinds of racial privilege so that it so that there isn't a kind of absolute hierarchy. Normally, it's common to talk about racial privilege among whites as fixed and complete, as if no one black could have some privileges economically or otherwise, that it's fixed. But if you think of it in more sort of um, almost privilege as a hierarchical matter within race, she talks, Shannon Sullivan talks about this notion of right, white priority as a way to get at working class white privileges that are not the same as middle class white privileges and that there can be middle class blacks who have economic privilege um, that, um, that don't immediately get, I don't want to use the word trumped, but it's what's coming to mind, <laughs> um, by, by white priority. So yeah. it's, it's a nuanced way of thinking about you know, the resistance among working class whites to say, what are you talking about white privilege? I'm poor. I'm, I don't have economic means. I don't have benefits. I don't have a, you know, a union job or whatever the, the complaints are. And sort of how do you talk about how race can be working both as a class disadvantage in specific examples and still generate some ability to talk about this, this, this extra component? I'm really glad to hear of that work. In the introduction to class, race, and Marxism, I try to, to say, I'm not on a campaign for this, but mm -hmm. if I could shape the language, it would be the language of white advantage instead of white mm -hmm. privilege. Mm -hmm. And it grew out of yeah. I was speaking on the radio, speaking up in Rochester, New York, and uh, I was on the NPR radio show there, call-in show for an hour. and, and I bet in an hour the interviewer, who was a great person, said white privilege 35 times. And I had just come to the studio from these trade unionists had taken me on a tour of Rochester, which is just a devastated town. Mm. I mean, it's a completely, de it didn't have heavy industry, but it's a classic deindustrialized town. It's got the fifth highest rate of uh, child poverty in the United, in the United States. Mm. It's, you know, uh, people, they whole neighborhoods where people had lost their mortgage. And so, you know, I, yeah, I went from there. It's the wrong word. It's the and, wrong, and, yeah. you know, it's like, it's... Right. There would have been no way to reach those white workers around the term white privilege because they didn't right. have that experience. Right. So some kind of more nuance. And I, this is not to say that a lot of great work by activists isn't done under the banner of white privilege and confronting white privilege. I completely understand that. Mm -hmm. But there's another moment where I think we have to have a little bit of a different mm -hmm. word. And also, you know, it shouldn't be 
that not getting murdered by a cop is a privilege <laughs> in, in this society. It's not a privilege. It's yeah. kind of what Ought it's be, human rights. Yeah. 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 Going briefly back to, to Baldwin and fear, that, that I think uh, segues to um, and the police, you know, the privilege of not being um, uh, gunned down. Uh, you know, everyone has been debating, you know, who voted for Trump? Was it the working class? But then there's the white women's vote, mm -hmm. right? And uh, of course, you might want to invoke your students again. Maybe they have an explanation. But, <laughs> but I wonder, I wonder how much of this ties into this stoking of fear, this racialized fear, right? Because I mean, it. it how, how have you been thinking about the role of gender in its relationship to the working class as yeah. this so-called base, right, which is assumed to be such a masculine, you know, heteronormative worker, yeah. um, but also the fears of race that are being generated and fomented in the ways in which women are both invoked as to be protected, but also their own fear is perpetually yeah. stoked. So as soon as you said, oh, if only we could get this environment that's just so, if we didn't have this group and this group and this Safe. group, it would be so, and I was yeah. like, oh, that's it looks like a, a Folgers yeah. commercial, you know, in some suburban place. Yeah. And it came right back around in the Alabama right. election. So right. I, I think that 53% of white women voted for more in an even more that one doesn't uh, that I don't even know what clear to do. <laughs> example of right yeah. after the charges and right, right. all these women right there before you, some of whom were known in the state, and then to be able to garner that uh, kind of vote. So I, I do think that that fear is one, I, I think in a certain way, Trump has gathered all of the single issue voters. Uh, and I think a lot of that mm. was uh, uh, an uh, uh, abortion, an anti-abortion mm -hmm. vote, single issue anti-abortion voting in which women can uh, see themselves as the custodians of that uh, pro-life movement mm -hmm. and can sacrifice themselves on that altar, can say, you know, yeah. Yes, but we have to hold our nose and vote for, for this guy because uh, uh, abortion is murder. Mm -hmm. So I think in Kansas, uh, the right, the, the gun issue so overwhelms everything else that it's the gathering up of all those pro-gun. So that's, that's go going on. But there's also a sense, I think... Because this is all, the Moore election was right at the beginning, beginning to be the beginning of the Me Too movement, which is really resonant. And it's not that that movement doesn't exist, and it's not that it doesn't exist in Alabama, and people aren't retweeting things to each other in Everybody. fundamentalist churches in, in, right. in Alabama. That, it, it's right. a real issue, but there's still a sense in which... Uh, white womanhood has connections to white masculinity that uh, it's asking a lot to deny. I'm, uh, mm -hmm. Cheryl Harris has, everybody knows Cheryl Harris's wonderful article, Whiteness is Property in Harvard Law Review from the mid 90s. I think the best thing that's been written on whiteness in, in my generation. But right after that, she wrote a, an article in Cardozo Law Review, equally long and equally great, called Finding Sojourner's Truth. And she kind of anchors it in the story of Sojourner Truth and Sojourner Truth's lost child. And she says, what's the difference in 1840 between white womanhood and African-American womanhood? And she says, more or less, white womanhood could only give birth to freedom. Mm -hmm. And black womanhood could only give birth to slavery. And, you know, that's a web of relationships that roots a lot of further relationships. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you're asking a lot. For, <laughs> I, I yeah. mean, yeah. it's necessary to ask a lot. But you're confronting some real material, long-standing things yeah. when uh, white women decide to stick with white men, even when those white men are abusive. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I also think, you know, it's uh, uh, sort of absurd to assume that women are feminists because they're women. You know, there's, you know, yeah. if that were the case, we would have solved a whole lot a long time ago. Um, so so it's it doesn't surprise me that much. But what what I think is important is the way 
um, we, people made that assumption, particularly among Democrats, right? That where, what were these of women course, voting yeah. for? Like they're just born feminists or born, you know, liberal feminists in particular. Yeah. Um, so, um, so there's all these potential intersecting dynamics, factions, fractures that you're describing, histories that are intertwined, but also, you know, limiting our imagination. Um, but we're still being asked from the left the most, it seems to me, that w with an insistence that this is the time to talk really race neutrally, that we need to, you know, I presumably class only. I'm not sure what replaces race. I want to hear what you have to say about that. But, but that, that basically we have to create unity through the emphasis of an overarching category that always seems to involve the erasure of race as a point of interpretation, understanding, et cetera. Yeah. What, what, I mean, this is an old debate, but for it to be back with such a vengeance, it, it just strikes me as odd. It seems to me so obvious that it's not going to work, but maybe I'm just you know, I, uh, being unreasonable. What, what do you think's going on with that? I like the old debates. I'm a historian. Yeah. It gives me <laughs> You're like, do it again, do it go again. Go back a little bit. <laughs> um, so I did, I'll only go back to the mid-1990s. Okay, and well, that's not We talked bad. about this at, at lunch a little bit today. Um, in the uh, Clinton triumph, the Bill Clinton triumph, uh, one of the key counties, the key county for his campaign was Macomb County outside of Detroit. Anybody from that area? Um, so his advisors, including the academic Stanley Greenberg, who became his uh, pollster, went to Macomb County and tried to figure out what it was that made these white Reagan Democrats tick. Mm -hmm. And they said, we're going to only hold interviews, focus group interviews, in the homes and, and institutions of Macomb County. Now, a lot of these were auto workers, and they worked in plants that were very, very integrated plants. But the idea was that you paid attention to the issues of these Reagan Democrats in their homes, in their counties. Mm -hmm. At that time, Macomb County was, I think, about 95 percent uh, white, and some with sundown towns properly. Mm -hmm. That research was funded by the Automobile Workers Union. It was funded by the UAW. Mm. And yet it skewed entirely to, to saying, let's define this problem as a problem not of workers, but of middle class people. And sometimes, so Stanley Greenberg's uh, book on this triumph in the election was called Middle Class Dreams. Mm -hmm. And that they convened these focus groups as middle class people who had to be not politically appealed to, but paid attention to. Right. And the focus groups revealed that integrated schools were a, a problem, busing was a problem, crime uh, was a problem, all of the kind of buzzword, code word issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, Clinton's campaign promised to end welfare as we know it, uh, promised to uh, mend uh, affirmative action, three strikes and you're out, the Effective Death Penalty Act, all of those things become Clinton era reforms and they rest on this idea that we're paying attention to white, to white workers. Mm -hmm. Macomb County, my uh, great student Taya Miles has a new book on the early history of, of Detroit and uh, it turns out that Macomb was the biggest slaveholder in uh, in that area, and it becomes then this county of mm. sundown towns uh, later on. In the 2016 election, Trump's strategists made Macomb County their key lab. They called it a laboratory wow. for returning the uh, the Republicans to, to to. They thought if if we can figure out a way to win that county, and they did resoundingly yeah. figure out a way to pay attention to the issues of of white workers. So I think that that. You know, there's this, this way in which um, we have to be very careful. One of the things that will happen now in the next round of primaries is there'll be Democratic candidates who say, I know how to listen to the concerns of white workers. Right. And they'll be listening to the concerns in a certain kind of environment, which mm -hmm. is not the only environment. I, I want to just say one more thing about that, because it, this was the... Uh, 
the moment when I was writing uh, Wages of Whiteness and, and then it came out and I was lecturing about it. And I was doing a lot of summer schools for the Automobile Workers Union at that time. I was telling people at lunch yes. that I would go into those summer schools and I'd say to maybe three quarters white workers, a quarter African American workers at that time, why would anybody, my work is about, here's what I'm interested in, my work is about why would anybody call themselves a white worker? I get how you call yourself white, I get how you call yourself a worker, but why do you want to call, why would anybody want to call the, yourself a, a white worker? And the white workers answered that question. And they said, oh, it's because you can get a job in the skilled trades in the automobile industry. You can live wherever you want. You can send your kids to good schools. You can get a home loan. Uh, the, the police don't, don't bother you as much. Of course, we, of course people will call themselves a, a, a white worker. So alongside that kind of stuff that was being relayed in the homes of Macomb County, in terms of white supremacist rhetorics about black people, there was a, not, there was a whole other available discourse, even right. at that moment, that could have been talked about and, and, and tapped into, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, right. So, it sounds like there's a kind of continuum of whiteness here going on, right? I mean, but they've been divided into the good and bad whites, right? Mm -hmm. The liberal whites those, as the good ones and these conservative or, or, or un, unintelligent somehow because they're working against their own best interests. Um, but can you talk a bit about um, whether or not they're on a spectrum? How, how do you think about ways of being white and whether or not there are ways of transforming that because it does. I mean, it, given all the investments we know, yeah. it's not like the category is going away. Right. And and you know, some could argue that certain kinds of whiteness has been cultivated over the past thirty or forty years to get us here. It's not it's not a fixed thing. It's a it's a constructed matter that's reinforced and highlighted, and and it's reinforced with benefits, with resources, and it's reinforced with rhetoric and ideology, um, but. I'm just wondering how we think about it, 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 whether or not it's on a continuum, whether or not there are you know, value judgments that you want to make. How, how, do, you, how do you think about the, the breadth of the category? And, and can, we, can we do more with it in a pro progressive way? You know, can we create progressive, you know, can we roll, can we have the anti-Fox network you know, that does the opposite? Mm. <laughs> you what know, it? Air America? Yeah, oh yeah, well, so much for that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, um. that, that was a success. <laughs> but, um. but, you know, something that cultivates a progressive, multiracially comfortable kind of whiteness, right? How's that possible? And, and how do you see the category operating, you know, overall? Well, first, first of all, I, I, I sometimes think and with the restrictions on immigration now, this may not quite be true, but um, I've sometimes worried about the critical study of whiteness as taking up so much space talking about whiteness. Uh, I've argued in places that the most important kind of interracial unity in the United States is black-brown unity now, and that uh, black-white unity has been super, or is about to be superseded uh, in that regard. So I think that one thing we have to watch out for is to kind of do the dream work of white supremacists for them by assuming that whites are always going to be the, the key constituency and yeah. that, that ev everything that matters in the United States is going to be associated with whiteness. After the election, uh, a graduate student and I did this small study that was uh, about Wisconsin. And we wanted to try to find out how voters in sundown towns, I knew from Joe Fagan, the sociologist, that over half of all towns in Wisconsin are sundown towns, that is, towns where black people had to be out of town by sundown and they remain uh, less than 1% African American to this, to this day. So the student and I wanted to find out how those towns voted because so much of what we were hearing was uh, acting as if uh, changes in white opinion were the product of actual knowledge and experience with right. people of color. And so we, we looked at these 
we couldn't do, get the data for towns. We looked at counties with a sundown town as their county seat, which it turns out is 58 out of 72 counties in, wow. in Wisconsin have sundown towns for, for a county seat. And sure enough, uh, Clinton barely lost Wisconsin. You could easily say that those sundown towns, which kind of in the press stood in for rural, poor, backwards, et cetera, they weren't always, but those sundown towns delivered the state mm. to Trump. But two other things were present. One was by far greater than that mm -hmm. was suburban Milwaukee, educated people, mm -hmm. middle class whites, educated whites who voted for Trump. Then they did. They voted for the Republican candidate in every election as far back as and even more. They voted for Trump. That group gets missed. It's that educated racist group right. that we have trouble identifying and talking about. It's much more easy for the press to talk about the Appalachian worker or the rural uh, uh, Wisconsin. But then I. Uh, I talked to Jim Lowen, who does this great work on sundown towns, and, and told him about this article. And he said, oh, take a look at those same counties in the 2008 election. And in the 2008 election, those 58 counties with all white towns as their county seat overwhelmingly voted for Obama. 55 to 45. Why? They voted for Obama. They're desperate places, change. They're places that if they're going to survive at all as a county, they need a strong state. Uh, so, hmm. you know, I, I think it's important to realize that these things are at least a certain amount fluid. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. so when you say, where can we tap in? I don't think it's so much a matter of uh, the, the biggest swing in a county was in a, a county called Calhoun County in Illinois, not too far from where I grew up. And uh, it went from 70-30 for Obama to 70-30 for Trump in the space of eight, eight years. And my son was, for a time, a legal aid attorney in, that served that county. And he said everything got shut down in that county, a very, 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 very poor county that still had public housing through rural agricultural administration uh, mm. homes. They all got shut. The Social Security office got shut. The experience of austerity in that mm. county right. was part of what Obama So it, it, it's about race. It's certainly, and one of the things I hope we talk about, at least in the question and answer, so the way that Trump and it has highlighted immigration, mm -hmm. uh, maybe even more than anti-black racism in his public appeals, mm -hmm. all of that I, I don't want to deny it all, but there are some other things that we mm -hmm. can attend to. In, yeah, in yeah. This, yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about the Black and Brown Alliance you yeah. referenced, because that seems particularly productive around, you know, uh, fighting anti-black racism and, you know, fighting the, the racism of immigration. Yeah. So, um, you know, do you, I mean, how, how important is race to the anti-immigration uh, strategy and 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 you know, uh, impulse in not just in Trump, but in, in his supporters and others. Yeah. One of the, th this was happenstance, but one of the things that really struck me in the last month was when Trump did the shithole country thing. Right. Which itself deserves some attention. It's an interesting example of, mm -hmm. uh, we say we're against structural racism, but it's when words get used what was really outrageous about Trump in the shithole country things was that he was openly saying, I'm going to discriminate against people on the basis of race. That was about policy. Right. And nobody really yeah, very much attended to the behavior. policy. Right. It, was, right. it was the, right. the, the bad words uh, associated with the policy. And both are reprehensible. But we do have to be able to talk about structural racism mm -hmm. when we talk about uh, Trump's uh, rhetoric. What was your question? Anti racism and anti immigrant policy. Yeah. You're right on it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that day after he, I think the night before he's issued this shithole country thing, and then the day or the day after was the King holiday celebration. And Trump really made a big thing out of the King holiday. Celebration and a few people who were invited protested, and some people didn't come. 
But mostly he pulled it off. And it reminded me of the way that during the campaign, there was plenty of anti-black racism in the Trump campaign. But at critical junctures, he chose to lead with the issue of immigration rather than uh, confront the kind of moral high ground that the civil rights movement, I think, still occupies in some ways in the, in the United States. And so I think that one of the things that's interesting about Trump is that he's got policies to hurt immigrants. And he's got rhetoric to hurt African Americans and policies as, as well. But there's this way in which he's pushing anti-immigration so far that it challenges us to think about how to build an alliance that defends immigrant rights and African American rights at the mm -hmm. same time. He's sort of giving us that task, I think, mm -hmm. by the very way that he's so uh, using anti-immigration and in that shit old country thing, anti-globalization, I think, to a certain extent, mm -hmm. to, to kind of define problems as being about outsiders. Mm -hmm. There's a, a great British sociologist who I recommend a lot named Satnam Verdi, who has a book called Class, Race, and the Racialized Outsider. And this concept of racialized outsider that he's theorized, I think, right. is really, really deeply mm -hmm. important in the United States right. now to think about people who are kind of racially on trial. They're just here. They're, they're uh, you know, and then maybe 40 years from now, they'll be of the same ethnicity, but not in that same exposed position that they are, as, especially if they're undocumented. But so uh, th this. Right. Is a, the black brown one, I think, is an issue that Trump poses for us. Mm -hmm. And it's an opportunity as well. It's an as, opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. And certainly the criminalization, the, the rendering of various immigrant groups as non white and their criminalization could be an important source of sort of connective tissue for, for mobilization. Yeah. Um, it's also a challenge for the anti incarceration movement because. Right. Some right wingers are getting interested in shrinking the side of, size of prisons and thinking that you can use new technologies to police people outside of prisons and maybe make money off of those mm -hmm. technologies. But immigration prisons are making up the, right. the slack. So the yeah. issues are actually posed in real life That's right. for us, I think. Exactly. Um, so trying to study white supremacy, is because this and one last question, we'll throw it open to the audience. Um, studying white supremacy is getting a lot of attention on campuses. You know, mm -hmm. you can study African American history; it doesn't usually generate the same level of hate mail. It gets it, but but there's been a tremendous outrage about the handful of courses in a few places that are tackling just the historical formation yeah. of white supremacy. Can you speak to that? I mean, is this a, a moment for whiteness studies that's politically valuable? You know, how much intimidation are you seeing in the field? What, what's your sense? Trisha asked me at lunch if I've gotten death threats recently, and I haven't actually, but uh, there are so many people uh, just down the road at Trinity, at Drexel. Uh, there have been case after case of people, particularly who study whiteness, who fall victim to this kind of... Uh, outrage uh, media coverage that, oh my God, people are in classrooms discriminating against white students. It's so old. I was, 1992, I was asked to be on Fox and Kindred shows. I was asked to drive to Chicago in order that people could yell at me and berate me on right wing TV shows <laughs> because it, so and and then it was like oh my god there's this new thing called the critical study they called it whiteness studies called whiteness studies and we should all be up in arms about it and so now over a period of decades yeah. every two or three years like clockwork there's a there's a, a series of, of shows on Fox and and other right wing uh, networks saying we just found out that this thing called whiteness studies and your kids are being exposed to it. And it's a tricky business because, you know, some of us are uh, anti-white in the sense that we think that whiteness is an ideology that's caused a lot of misery 
uh, in the world. And so it's easy enough in the case of uh, Johnny uh, Williams at Trinity, it's easy enough to find an out of context quote where somebody says, I don't wish good fortune to, the, to whiteness. I, 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 I wish it would disappear. And then that becomes gen, you know, genocidal. Right. In, and it, it actually is an example of a, 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 we can't critically study whiteness without being able to say that whiteness is harmful and doesn't help right. white people. And so when that threat is made, we have to find some way. Right. Um, I, got, I was absolved from it because I never, I was always able to say, I've never taught a course on whiteness and never would. I, I consider whiteness, uh, all part of people who teach such courses, but I consider whiteness to be part of ethnic studies. If you're gonna critically study whiteness, I think it grows out of and is best embedded in ethnic studies. So mm -hmm. I've never, whenever people say, why don't you come on and talk about your terrible course in whiteness <laughs> studies, I'm always able to say, no, that's not me. So, yeah. yeah, well, that's a good move, if, if for no other reason. Um, so what do you think the post-Trump landscape will look like? I mean, just, I mean, who knows, but what would you say at this point? The thing that's interested me in, yeah. in policy terms... Oh, there's going to be a post-Trump landscape. There will be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's a fact. Yeah. We just have to make you sure... You heard it here. <laughs> we just have to make sure there's still a landscape. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Post-Trump landscape. Yeah, good point. Um, but one of the things that's interested me about the tax policy is <laughs> how little there was of mobilization against in the streets against the tax bill compared to some of the other mm -hmm. things and how we're hardly hearing anybody in opposition to Trump saying uh, if we win the midterm elections we'll repeal this this tax yeah. policy. It's very interesting. So I think that the important intellectual and political debates are going to be about are we getting rid of Trump are, are we getting rid of the kind of uh, ideas that Trump pushed, the policies that Trump pushed? Right. And I think that's a big one. Are, are uh, Democratic politicians going to be willing to say, we describe this as a disaster mm. for working people, and as soon as we get an opportunity, we're going to get rid of that disaster? And you can, you can write that in a lot of different ways, or uh, apply it in a lot of different ways. Uh, are we against uh, uh, anti-immigrant saber rattling because Trump is doing it? Or are we also cognizant of the fact that those deportations were going on Under Obama. At, at about the same rate? Yep. And so, you know, I think we, that's one, one of the challenges of the post-Trump landscape is whether there can be a kind of a meaningful, radical, yep. anti-racist uh, uh, response that moves, uh, moves the needle beyond the alternatives that we've had so far. Right. right. I, there will be more Trumps, less outrageous, but same deal, or more outrageous. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's same the deal. question. Uh, yeah. So, you know, if we don't attend to some of those, cool. those matters. Yeah. There will always be people, uh, there's a sense in which whiteness is a self-fulfilling uh, proposition that, you know, white people, People always ask me, I was lecturing in a prison in, in uh, southern, central Illinois not too long ago, and 80 black inmates, 20 Latino in, inmates, and they had read uh, Working Toward Whiteness, which is about the early 20th century. And they, they had one question on all of their minds, and, they, and at the very end, somebody finally asked it and said, uh, so uh, are Latinos going to become white? <laughs> and, uh, and both the Latino inmates and the black inmates Wanted were really know. interested in that question for very good reasons. They were, they were trying to figure out how to get along with each other, and they were being really honest. Mm. And, and, uh, but as long as whiteness means having 11 times as much wealth as African Americans, people in immigrant populations are going to want to become white. Yeah. I mean, it's a material fact that if you don't address that differential, there's yeah. a, mater a, a compelling material incentive to, to think about yourself as becoming white in yeah. the United States. So right. 
structural things are needed to change right. that. It's not right. just about uh, you know having a more civil president. No, definitely not. Not. Well, we're going to take some questions, but first, I just want to thank David Rodiger for this great conversation. Thank you. For